Welcome to our online service. I'm John Dack, the Children's and Family Pastor, and it's my privilege to be your host today. We've got a great service planned for you. We have a wonderful message from our worship pastor, Isaac Holes. And we have some events that we want you to be aware of. Women out there, our women's ministry is holding a women's bonfire this coming Thursday. You can get all the information for that event at northwood.cslee backslash events. We also have our children's and youth programming starting up real soon. You can get information for that by signing up for the emails off of our homepage. Let's get ready to worship together by praying. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this Sunday morning. And we thank you, Lord, that we can worship together. And I just pray now, Lord, that Pastor Isaac's message would reach to the hearts of those watching today. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Philippians 2, 5 through 11. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus Christ, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father.
Thy faithfulness, O oh God, my Father, there is no shadow of turning with Thee. Thou changest not Thy compassions, they fail not, as Thou hast been forever will be. Great is Thy faithfulness, great thy faithfulness morning by morning new mercies I see all I have needed thy hand hath provided great is thy faithfulness Lord unto me
Hello, hey, my name is Isaac Holst. I'm our worship pastor here at Northwood Church, if we haven't had the chance to meet. I'm so glad that you're tuning in for this service. We've been going through a series uh, called Reminders. Uh, we've been looking at truths from God that are great reminders for us in what's been one of the craziest years of each of our lives. Uh, we've looked at reminders such as how the world is broken, how we need each other. We've talked about learning to lament. We've talked about suffering, and just this last week we talked about how Jesus is coming back. We're about to finish this series and reminders next week, and I'm going to be talking this morning about a really significant reminder, which is that God provides for all of our needs. So I'm going to read a focus verse for us from Philippians 4, verse, uh, chapter 4, verse uh, 19 here. It says this, and the same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs from his glorious riches, which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. My first thought as I read that is nice. You know, that's like such a great encouragement. It's so true. The Lord really does provide for us. I can think of countless times of examples where uh, people I know received anonymous checks. I've received checks for uh, things that I needed that I didn't have money for, and it was the exact amount. Um, and I, you know, my birth story is another great example of uh, the Lord providing for health for my mom and for me. Uh, she was told she wouldn't walk if she carried me to full term, uh, and she's still walking around uh, to this day. And so there's just countless examples that I have from my own life, and I'm sure that you guys have examples too. Uh, so God, thank you uh, for providing for us. That's just such an honor and a blessing to be provided for uh, by our King and Father. And that's the first thought I have when I read that verse. Uh, and then the second thought I have is, wait a second. <laughs> no, God God doesn't provide for all of our needs. It was like six, no, three, what is it, three, four months ago now in the middle of shelter at home. And um, uh, I just remember, you know, two weeks at home, you know, and uh, Disney Plus didn't live up to the hype. And, you know, it's 9.30. I look at Google Maps and it says that Dairy Queen's open till 10. And I really want uh, a Reese's Blizzard. So I get my car, head over, and Dairy Queen is closed. You know, they, uh, Google Maps had the time wrong. And I'm just like, God, surely somewhere in your, your glorious riches, you got space for an extra Reese's Blizzard for one of your sons, right? You know, but, you know, this, this hyperbole obviously is meant to demonstrate that we all seem to experience, you know, an apparent lack at some point or another in our life. Uh, you know, something that we have a strong desire for, but the Lord just hasn't provided for it for some reason or other. You know, usually it happens at, at Target, you know. Uh, Ten-year-old Isaac, uh, for ten-year-old Isaac, it was the $300 Lego sets. You know, I'd be walking down the aisle, and my mom would be like, oh, sorry, Isaac, you know, the Lord didn't provide for that. And now for 25-year-old Isaac, it's the uh, $300 Lego sets. You know, walking down the aisle, and Jenna's like, oh, oh, God didn't provide for that. So, you know, I feel like we should almost uh, make an adaptation to this verse and read it, say, and this, the same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs from his glorious riches, which have been given to you uh, in Christ Jesus. You know, $300 Lego sets not included. You know, that, I feel like we need to qualify this promise at times, you know. But obviously, Isaac, obviously, Isaac, you know, you don't, you don't honestly expect God to just provide for everything you could ever want, right? You know, you got to make a distinction between a need and a want, some of you are probably thinking that. That's good. That's kind of what I wanted you to be thinking. Because on a personal level, we use this distinction of needs and wants to cover up this cognitive dissonance we have uh, between the promise that God is going to provide everything and the feeling of lack that we have in our world. And, you know, maybe that's the case. Maybe these things are really just wants and not needs. But I think we're also scared to entertain the thought that God might have made a mistake. And so I do want to actually confront this thought head on, uh, this distinction between needs and wants, and see if it actually solves the, the cognitive dissonance that we feel. Um, and I'm going to be upfront with you. 
I actually think that the concept of needs and wants is not helpful for this conversation. Uh, I think it's actually irrelevant to this conversation uh, because it doesn't sufficiently erase the feeling of lack that we have and it doesn't sufficiently defend God as provider. Um, two main reasons for that. First, our personal experience is not the universal personal exp or the universal experience of those around the world in different parts of time and space, right? Uh, we here in America, in Maple Grove, you know, may not experience real needs. I mean, if I have to get to ice cream and Legos before I question the provision of God, there's not really much of a question. But we know that's not the case for everyone throughout history and everyone around the world. We know that there have been believers uh, for whom their basic human needs have not always been guaranteed. So making a distinction between needs and wants becomes more or less irrelevant as soon as a believer dies of starvation. So that's the first reason I don't think it's very effective to make that distinction. The second one is uh, that the provision that's ascribed to God throughout all of Scripture isn't this measly provision. You know, Paul says he's going to provide from all, for all of your needs, but he says it's out of his glorious riches that have been given to us. And uh, we even read, a, you know, a famous example in the book of Psalms. It says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. $300 Lego sets not included. Uh, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. Later on, my cup overflows. That language describes more than basic needs. It's all up in want territory, you know? So, if anything, I think distinguishing between needs and wants only seems to exacerbate our cognitive dissonance, uh, this feeling of lack and this promise of provision. This is just, this is just an, uh, another version of the classic problem of evil, which states, if God is good, why do bad things happen? Uh, the version that we're looking at this morning is, uh, if God promises to provide, why do I feel a lack? And we're going to come up with a few different explanations. Um, first, we'll just hit the first one in first because it's super easy. It's maybe Paul's lying to us or maybe he got it wrong, right? <laughs> and... Uh, you know, as somebody who has always found scripture to be uh, reliable uh, for teaching and correcting thought and behavior, I'm going to start out by assuming Paul is not lying when he says God's going to provide for all of our needs uh, and that there's maybe something else going on here. And if after we look at everything, we still aren't convinced, you know, maybe we end up on Paul's line, but hopefully we can find something else going on here. Uh, so I'm going to look at two other ways of looking at this issue. And I want to be upfront with you that, uh, like with many matters of faith, uh, when we step into relationship with our creator, things aren't always going to make sense. If you tuned in last week to Chris Moore's message about how Jesus is coming back, he read this long passage of scripture. And in there, there was this paragraph and two verses right next to each other. One said, uh, you, some of you may be put to death. And then the next one said, but not a hair on any of your heads will be harmed. And Chris, I think rightly so pointed out that that's just one of those paradoxes, one of those what I would call beautiful mysteries where both of those things are just true at the same time and we don't know why or how, uh, but we just have to come to terms with that. And I want to encourage you with this next thought. Uh, one of the most sensible things that you can do is give yourself permission for your worldview to not make sense. I'm going to say that again. One of the most sensible things that you can do is give yourself permission for your worldview to not make sense. So you guys have permission from me to believe things that seem to contradict each other and just engage in these beautiful mysteries together with humility. Uh, so let's jump in. Uh, let's, let's read some scripture this morning. 
Uh, it's always good when, uh, when I come across a verse in Scripture that I don't understand to just read the verses right before, right after. Read the bigger picture so I get a larger thought, especially when I read Paul. This almost always gives me more clarity. So we're going to do that, and I encourage you to do that whenever you're reading Scripture. Uh, we're going to read from Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 10, going through verse 20 here. It says, How I praise the Lord that you are concerned about me again. I know you have always been concerned for me, but you didn't have the chance to help me. Not that I was ever in need, for I've learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I've learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little, for I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Even so, you have done well to share with me in my present difficulty. As you know, you, the Philippians, were the only ones who gave me financial help when I first brought you the good news and then traveled on from Macedonia. No church, uh, no other church did this. Even when I was in Thessalonica, you helped me once more. I don't say this because I want a gift from you. Rather, I want to receive, I want you to receive a reward for your kindness. At the moment, I have all I need and more. I am generously supplied with the gifts you sent me from Epaphroditus. They are a sweet-smelling sacrifice that is acceptable and pleasing to God. And the same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs from his glorious riches, which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. $300 Lego set not included. Uh, Now all glory uh, glory to God the Father forever and ever. Amen. So this is, this is really helpful, isn't it? Because now, uh, rather than just having this one claim that God provides for all of our needs, uh, our claim is wrapped up in this story, uh, this, this interchange between Paul and the Philippian church. And we get to see how he integrates that claim with other things that are going on in his life. So he says, he starts out by you know, thanking the Philippian church for sending him money. Uh, and then he goes on to say that he's never been in need, which for those of us who've gotten to know Paul, we know that's just a silly thing for him to say because, you know, Paul has been beaten. Paul has been put in prison. He's been almost killed. He's gone without food. He's gone without companionship. He has uh, not had his physical material needs met for a large portion of his life. Uh, But he goes on to explain this by saying, I've learned the secret to living in every situation and I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Uh, What Paul might be doing here is he might be differentiating between the spiritual needs that we have and then material things going on in our life. He might be flipping the script a little bit uh, in the way that he approaches what needs are. And that's the first way that I want to approach this issue, uh, to understand that none of the things that we think of as needs or wants should maybe be thought of as needs or wants. Uh, we could call this approach something like material depreciation or maybe stoicism because what it does is it says that material things, physical things around us are never things that we need. And when we say that God provides for all of our needs, what we're really saying is he's providing something for us spiritually so that we can live life to the fullest regardless of what circumstances come our way. Uh, and I think this is a really helpful approach. Uh, it's, it's one that's been used throughout history, and I think everybody here should learn from this approach. Uh, what I find attractive about this approach is, firstly, it lines up with how Paul describes his thought. He says that he's learned to live on a full stomach and an empty stomach. He's learned to live with a lot or a little. And uh, that seems to differentiate between the material things he has and the quality of life that he has or or what he would describe as having needs. Um, So it lines up with his thought. Secondly, uh, I really appreciate that this approach prioritizes things of the spirit um, over things of the flesh. Uh, I I really appreciate that it doesn't have an emphasis on self. We know uh, just that one of the things that Paul is wanting to accomplish in writing this to the Philippian church is to make sure that they understand that he doesn't want them 
to feel like they have to provide him with money. Uh, other religious figures and philosophers in Philippi were trying to gather crowds and gather a following and then extort money from them. And Paul wanted to make sure that the Philippian church didn't confuse him with that approach. He wanted them to know that things of the spirit are more valuable to him than things of the world. And I appreciate that this stoic approach uh, really engages with that idea well. Uh, and finally, this is maybe most important, this approach does solve the apparent paradox between the promise of provision and the presence of lack in our life. Uh, we ask the question, why does God not provide for these things? Uh, the answer, they're not actually needed and they shouldn't even be maybe wanted. They are material things and we should focus on things of the spirit. And before I talk about a few points of caution that I have with this approach, I do want to say this is a healthy thing for us to uh, integrate into our lives. I think we all need a healthy dose of stoicism. Uh, we need our faith and our relationship with God not to be dependent on material things because as we know from Paul's life in our own lives, material things come and go and we should be made of sterner stuff than that. Um, but in the same step with that thought, I want to caution us against embracing, uh, embracing stoicism like full on because they are, there are some drawbacks to this approach and I want to fly through these quickly. Um, firstly, uh, full-on stoicism can kind of breed emotional uh, stiffness or emotional disengagement from the world around us. You're probably familiar with the word stoic because it's used to describe somebody who's maybe cold or distant personality um, or maybe really cause and effect. And that's because those throughout history who tried to emotionally detach from material things often embodied a very non-emotive spirit. But we know that the Lord created this earth, that he called it good. He's called us to live lives filled with joy, and he's called us to live life abundantly. And so uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't caution you against indulging in things of this world uh, and enjoying the things that God has put on this earth for us, because we know that he has done that for us. So that's my first caution, is not to, not to completely detach from the world. And the second is to not completely detached from our bodies. Uh, the other thing that is maybe dangerous with stoicism is that it has a low view of the body because the spirit is what is most fundamental. And I do believe that that's true, that the most valuable thing about us is our spirit. But it, it's embodied in our body. Our body is a temple for not just our spirit, but the Holy Spirit. And so we need to make sure that we take care of our bodies because we're holistic beings and our emotions and our spirit are all tied into that. So I don't think we can detach from that or compartmentalize that out. Um, but here's my most, uh, I'd say the most important caution I have with this view, and that's that uh, this approach doesn't line up with the whole of Jesus's ministry. When Jesus came to earth, we see the miracles that he did, right? Food for the thousands, healing for the sick, casting out of demons, raising the dead. And uh, I don't think Jesus just did this to demonstrate his power. That might be a thought that we have. But no, I think Jesus could have demonstrated his power through a myriad of different miracles. But he decided to do miracles that were other-oriented and that met physical needs of people. And we know that Jesus is the ultimate revelation of God the Father here on earth. And I think God wanted to reveal his heart to humanity by having Jesus meet physical needs for people and show them that he cares about them specifically and personally. So although we do need a healthy dose of stoicism on a personal level, I think it's critical that we don't apply this approach uh, systematically uh, or on a systemic level. When we see somebody else who's hungry, our first thought should not be, well, you know, through Christ, you can live on a full or an empty stomach because you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. You know, that's not a loving approach. So we need something more than just stoicism to respond to this question, to this cognitive dissonance of the promise of provision and the presence of lack. So the other approach, and I think this is a little bit less concrete, so everybody, let's take a second, let's open up our, our creative part of our brain, you know, shift both parts of your brain towards the front, and uh, that's, you know, just how I do it, to open up the creative part of my brain. Let's think here. Uh, it's possible, 
that our material reality doesn't accurately depict truth. Specifically, the truth of our identity as sons and daughters of the Most High. Think about it. Many of us believe that we were once dead in our sin, but because of what Jesus did on the cross, we are a new creation and we've been joined with him and we're blameless and spotless in the eyes of God. That's just, that's a beautiful promise, right? Like that deserves an amen. People watching this video were once hopeless, were once dead in sin, but now thanks to the work of Jesus on the cross, they've been made new. They're fresh, they're blameless, without blemish before the eyes of the Almighty. That's amazing. So why am I such a trashy person? <laughs> why do I still struggle with pride and selfishness and greed and lust and anxiety? Aren't I a new creation? Sometimes I just want to say, like, God, didn't, didn't you tell my stomach that I'm no longer a glutton? Like, something got lost in communication there. And... It's moments like these where we have to decide if we're going to believe that what God sees in us is truer than what we see from our worldly experience. We have to decide which version of reality we're really going to live into, the one that God sees or the one that we see. And, you know, maybe it's the same thing with provision. Maybe the Lord is a good shepherd who really does make our cup overflow and provides for all of our needs and the material world around us just isn't reflecting that truth. Try that out at Christmas this year. What? No presents? No, I got you presents. They just aren't being reflected by our material world. <laughs> Stupid. <laughs> I know this sounds crazy, but guys, I'm actually describing a commonly known theological principle called the already but the not yet. And this is a really transformational way to understand our reality because it changes the way that we interact with the world around us. You see, when Jesus came and died and rose again, uh, we are able to be made joint heirs with him who not just get to enter heaven as guests, but as joint heirs. And we get to sit with him on the seat of authority as his bride. That happened already 2,000 years ago. But then Jesus left, uh, and he's not yet come back to conquer the world and to take us to the new heavens and earth. You see, because of those two facts, we're living in this constant paradox of things that are already true of us that are not yet represented in the world around us. One of those things is our righteousness, which is already true of us, but not yet represented by our lives. And maybe another one of these is provision that is already true of us that our king has provided everything we need out of his glorious riches, but it's just not always being reflected in the life that we live. When you go to buy your first home, uh, you meet with your real estate agent and you take out a huge loan, you sign on a dotted line, and then you hear the words, congratulations, you're a homeowner. What happens next is you got to move in. <laughs> uh, Jesus had a vision for this age. I don't, I don't view this already but not yet age as an in-between limbo season. I view it as a very much intentional move on the part of God. When Jesus left, he said, it is better that I go because when I go, the Holy Spirit, the advocate, will come. And that's when God with us changed to God in us. Giving us the strength to do all things. Coming with gifts of the Holy Spirit, enabling us to do the work of the ministry. We see how the first church responded to this call in Acts chapter 4. Here in verse 32, I'll read this. It says, All the believers were united in heart and mind, and they felt that what they owned was not their own, so they shared everything they had. The apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's great blessing was upon them all. 
There were no needy people among them because those who owned land or houses would sell them and bring the money to the apostles to give to those in need. There were no needy people among them because those who owned land or houses would sell them and bring the money to the apostles to give to those in need. (laughs) This first church made the world around them reflect the reality that God had already spoken into their lives. They started unloading the truck and they moved God in. We see it also in the passage we read earlier today. I'm actually going to go back and read some of that, just some little sections so that we can see this again. Paul says, How I praise the Lord that you are concerned about me again. You've always been concerned for me. He says, you were the only ones that gave me financial help when I first brought you the good news. And then even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me help more than once. And he even says, even now I am, I'm generously supplied with gifts you sent me with Epaphroditus. The Philippian church also made the world around them reflect the truth that God had spoken over them. They moved God in to Paul's life. In other books, Paul says that we are the body of Christ. So when on a systemic level, we hear the question, why aren't my needs being met? I don't think we should just think about that question being directed to God. I think we should think about that question being directed to us as God's body, as Christ's body, and his representative here on earth. That's the mindset that the first church had. That's the mindset that the Philippian church had. And that's the mindset that we should have. So that's our challenge this morning. To think about the world the way that God thinks about the world as provided for. (laughs) To help usher the kingdom of heaven here to earth. So let's embrace this call to join the Lord in his mission to provide for the needs of people. Understand that you're not always going to be successful every time you provide finances or healing or water or even love. But you've already been given the authority to do so. And I want to challenge us to do so. And let's pray, Lord, we want to be vessels for you here on earth. We want to be people who usher in the reality that you've spoken over this earth that it is provided for. I pray that you would reveal to us places where we could help meet needs and help you in your work of provision. Lord, I pray for everybody watching that their needs would be met. Their needs for healing, Lord, in your name. Their financial needs to get out of debt in your name. Lord, I pray that you'd reveal to each of us at least one specific way that you're calling us to continue to step into the work of your ministry while we await uh, your return and your second coming. We love you, Lord, and we're so grateful for the truth that you've spoken over us, even though we don't always see it in the world around us. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.
Thanks for watching the service today. We're glad that you joined us. We want to make sure that you stay up to date on everything happening at Northwood. So just head on over to the northwood.cc backslash events and check out everything that's going on at Northwood. And also help spread the message about this worship service by liking and subscribing to this video. And we'll see you next week. God bless.